In this video, we're going to look at the Routh Hurwitz Stability Criterion and Array. And uh, we'll reference uh, FPE section 3.6. The Routh Stability Criterion uh, says two things. First, that a necessary condition for stability is that all coefficients of the characteristic polynomial or of a transfer function have the same sign, either positive or negative. So for second order systems, this is, uh, makes our life easy. If all the coefficients have the same sign, we're guaranteed stability. However, for third order polynomials, you can have a sign change and still have stability. Uh, and so Routh's uh, second stability criterion says that a system is stable if and only if all elements of the first column of the Routh, Routh array have the same sign, positive or negative. So this gives us the ability to look at stability for higher order systems uh, by using the Routh array. So how do we form the Routh array? Well, first, let's look at um, an example of a transfer function. So Let's let our transfer function, h of s, be defined as, say, b1 s to the m plus b2 s to the m minus 1 plus dot, 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 plus b sub m s to the 0. And then, sorry, this is m plus 1. And then that's all over, say, s to the n plus a1 s to the n minus 1 plus dot 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 plus a n minus 1 s plus a sub n. So the way we form the Ralph Hurwitz ar array is to take the coefficients of the denominator of the transfer function and place them into uh, the entries of the array. Once we have the transfer function, we can start forming the array by first taking the powers of s that show up in the uh, denominator of the transfer function and placing those in a column, say s to the n, s to the n minus 1, s to the n minus 2, and I have s to the n minus 3, dot, 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 and then s squared, s to 1, and then s to the 0. And then we can draw some lines here so we can start forming our table. And we'll do an example with some actual numbers in here. And then we can form the columns, and down, and down. And then we start, as I said, placing the elements, uh, sorry, the coefficients of the denominator into the elements of the array. So we start with 1, which is the coefficient in front of s to the n. And then we skip to the next element. So here, uh, the next coefficient. So this would be a2 would show up there. And then if I had another uh, coefficient there, I'd add a4, and so on until we get out to as many coefficients as we have that um, uh, to, to uh, account for the entire transfer function. And then in the second row, we place all the other coefficients here. So that would be start with a1, and then a3, and a5, dot, 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 etc. And then we would start filling in the, coefficient, the uh, other elements of the Routh array, b1, b2, through b3, and then this out till we get to a 0. And we're going to have zeros out here as well. And then we fill in c1, c2, c3, dot, 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 until we get to 0. And then down here, we're going to have some entries that we'll have to calculate. And then eventually, we'll get down to the point where we have a 0 there. And the last element always ends up being the last coefficient of the transfer function. So this is how we form the array. And then finally, we have to calculate the coefficients, say, b1. And the way we do this is to take the negative of the determinant of the uh, subarray, or subarray uh, of the uh, Roth array, that's directly above the uh, element b1. And so we have minus we have minus the determinant of one and then a two and then a one and a three and then we divide that all by a one. We take the to find b two we do a similar operation only now we take the negative determinant of the subarray and instead of taking this whole subarray right here we're actually going to take the, we're going to strike out this column and use this, the first column and the third column. So I would have 1, a4, a1, 
A5. And then again, we divide the whole thing by A1. And then we would keep going. Notice C1. We could keep going with, uh, with B3 and so on using the same process. We take the first column and then the column after the uh, current element we're in and then divide by A1. For C1, we follow the same process. We take the negative of the determinant. And again, we use the first column above C1. So that would be um, A1 and B1. And then we take the column after C1. So that's going to be A3 and B2. Two, and then again we divide by the element directly above uh, C1 or in the first column there. So divide by B1, and we're done with element C1. And then if we wanted to find element <coughs> C2, again we follow the same process: negative determinant of the. We take the first column A1 and B1, and then we take the column after. Uh, C2, so that's A5 and B3, so A5 and B3, and then again we divide by B1. And we just keep going and working our way down the array until we get um, zeros out here, and then we can stop calculating and eventually we'll get to A sub n. So let's do a simple example. Let's let H of S be equal to 1 divided by s to the 6th plus 4s to the 5th plus 3s to the 4th plus 2s to the 3rd plus s squared plus 4s plus 4. Now, this is just some arbitrary transfer function, and you know it would have come from somewhere. Um, and we'll see some other examples where we have a transfer function that looks a little more uh, relevant, but this again, just some transfer function. So we go ahead and start forming our array. We take s to the sixth, s to the fifth, s to the fourth, s to the third, s squared, s to the one, and then s to the zero. So write out our rows here. And then fill in some columns. We're going to need one more column out here. And so we start filling in the coefficients. So we start with the lead coefficient is 1, and then we skip 1 to the third, uh, the third coefficient. And then we go to the fifth, which is a 1, and then to the last one here, which is a 4. All right, so notice I've, I've moved this coefficient down there, move that one to there, that one down there, and this last one goes all the way down there. Then we take the other coefficients, so I have a 4, so I'm looking at the s to the 5th, and then I take the skip 1, go s uh, to the 3rd, which would be a 2, and then s to the 1, which would then be 4, and then I can put a 0 in here because there's no other elements, I can also put a 0 there. So now we do our cross, multiply, and divide. Uh, this element here, b1, we can calculate, I'll just do it over here, b1 is minus the determinant of 1, 3, 4, and 2, and then that's all divided by 4. So we have minus the determinant 1, 3, 4, 2 over 4. So the determinant here is going to be minus 1 times 2 minus 3 times 4, 1 times 2 minus 3 times 4, and then that's all over 4. So we get minus 2 plus 12 over 4, which ends up being 10 fourths, or five halves. So we end up with B1, go ahead and delete that, is going to be five halves. So we keep going. B2, I take uh, the negative determinant of one times four minus one times four divided by four. So notice that just comes out to zero. And I go to the next element out here and I take negative determinant of 1 times 0 t minus 4 times 4 divided by 4. So notice I'm going to end up with just 4. And then if I go out further, I'm going to take 1 times 0 minus 0 times 4 with a minus sign divided by 4. So again, I just end up with 0. So once I get out to here where there's all zeros, I don't have to calculate anymore because they're all just 0. 
for S3, uh, for S to the third, then this would be, say, C1. And again, I can calculate C1 as negative determinant of, uh, take four, five halves, two, and zero, and then divide that by five halves. And the zero kind of helps me out. Notice I end up with just two. All right. So we can put a two in there. And for this element, say C2, um, I can calculate that out over here. C2 is negative determinant of, I take these elements, four and five halves in the, in the first column. And then I take these elements, which are after C2, in the second column, four and four. And then I divide by five halves. And when you work this out, you end up with minus 12 fifths. So I can put that in here. And minus 12 fifths. And as I keep going down, I'm going to get a zero here. On s to the s squared term, I get, again, just do multiply. You can take this determinant, divide by 2. I end up with 3. I get a 4 here, the 0 there. I end up with minus 76 fifteenths for this term there, the 0. And then again, you can see if I take negative determinant of this block right here, divide by minus 76 fifteenths, I end up with 4 which again is just the last uh, coefficient over here. So now I can move down the first column of the Routh array and I can count up the number of sign changes that occur. This is positive, 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 positive. Then I get a negative, so that's one sign change right there. And then I go minus to plus, so that's another sign changes. So there are two sign changes, which implies that there are two roots with positive real part, or in the, the right half of the complex plane. So we could easily switch to MATLAB and verify uh, that this is indeed the case. It turns out that um, if we use MATLAB, uh, we can show that the uh, poles are actually at minus 3.26 for the roots, um, 0 0.68 uh, plus or minus j times 0 0.75, uh, minus 0 0.6 plus or minus j times 0 0.99, and minus 0 0.89. So you see, indeed, there are two uh, poles or roots that have positive real part. Uh, so this system would be unstable.